Welcome to Clean Lakes, Yahara, Clean Lakes, Yahara Lakes 101 Life Science Cafe of the Year. Uh, Life Science Cafe of the Year. I'm Elizabeth Kirstein, Director of Corporate Giving at National Guardian Life Insurance Company, along with presenting sponsors, First Weber Foundation and Johnson Financial Group, and hosting sponsor, the Edgewater, the University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, and media partner of the Isthmus, National Guardian Life Company is proud to be the supporting sponsor of Yahara Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. Just a quick few announcements. First, we want to thank the businesses and organizations that became Lake Partners in the month of January. Thank you so much. Lake Partners make donations outside of tickets, sponsorships, or events. If your company hasn't signed up to become a 2019 Lake Partner, please see Clean Lakes Alliance staff member. You get some more information on that. Second, we want to thank everybody who came out over the last, or out last two weeks ago uh, to help celebrate frozen assets. Over 6,000 people were here at the Edgewater to uh, help celebrate frozen assets. The um, Edgewater was uh, very kind and giving to host this huge event, and um, we want to thank them especially. We're excited to share that the event netted over 127,000 for Clean Lakes Alliance. That's exciting. Yeah, that's a great, great accomplishment. Finally, I know it's hard to think spring, but mark your calendars for Wednesday, May 8th for the annual Clean Lakes Alliance Community Breakfast. Such a great event. Um, this year's event will be moving to the Alliant Energy Center, and more details on that can be found at the website, cleanlakesalliance.org. So back to Yahara Lakes 101. Today we are going to be discussing a very timely topic, that's for sure, it's about salt. And more specifically, we're going to look at how salt applied to roads, driveways, and walkways is affecting our lake. Our, actually, our lakes, not our lake. Presenting on this topic is University of Wisconsin Center for Limnology Assistant Professor, Dr. Hilary Dugan. One of Dr. Dugan's recent research projects examined long-term fluoride trends in more than 500 lakes in North America and Europe. Her research, which balances field-based programs with the use of analytical models, has taken her around the world, including a research trip to Antarctica. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hilary Dugan. All right, that sounds good. All right, thank you all for being here and braving the weather. Um, it's a really timely uh, opportunity to talk about growth salt and how that's impacting the lakes here in Madison, but also the lakes around the state, um, and honestly the lakes around a large part of this continent. Um, before I forget, I have a plug from the sewage district. They have a lot of great handouts on how you should be applying road salt, so come and grab one of these um, at the end of my talk today. All right, um, yeah, as, uh, as the introduction said, I'm uh, an assistant professor at the Center for Limnology. We are down the Lakeshore Path. Um, we've been in operation for decades, and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, world class lake research that's, that's come out of the University of Wisconsin. And so it's great to be here and be able to talk to you about um, some of what we're what we're doing these days. Um, this time of year, you can't get away from road salt. You see it every time you drive. You probably clean it off your dog's paws. It's in the newspaper every week. Um, we see it discussed when it comes to corrosion, we see it discussed when it comes to drinking water, and we also see it a lot when it comes to our freshwater resources. So what it's doing to lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Um, I want to start with a little sort of chemistry primer, just because a lot of times we don't really think about why we're using salt and what it does and how it works. Yeah. Um, so water's you know, a fascinating molecule. Life wouldn't exist if it wasn't for water. Um, and what happens when 
water's liquid is that there's constantly these H2O molecules that are bouncing around, and they're sometimes forming hydrogen bonds. And then as that, as the temperature outside cools down, that thermal motion slows down, and they become so slow that they actually hydrogen bond to each other in this really grid-like structure that we you know of as ice. And salt works because when it dissociates, when it starts, is when it dissolves in water into two molecules, usually sodium and chloride, it ends up breaking up those bonds. And so it kind of just gets in the way. There's actually no real chemistry that makes salt effective. It's more just it's physically there and getting in the way of salt forming. Um, and so when we put down salt, which we usually use sodium chloride, those break into two separate ions and just get in the way of ice forming. And that works down to um, above minus 20 degrees Celsius, but the colder it gets, the more salt you need for it to be effective. And so really below like 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it, you, it loses its efficacy. You might have also heard that there's other types of salts. There's calcium chloride, there's magnesium chloride, there's um, sodium acetate. And so these, these terms are tossed around as well. Um, and what's interesting is that Calcium and magnesium tend to work at lower temperatures, and so people will often use them when it's really cold because sodium chloride stops working. Um, and again, there's no real sp special chemistry to it. It's actually just that they have more ions per molecule, and so there's just more things to get in the way of, some, of water freezing. Um, and so it's really just disrupting that formation of ice. Um, but for the most part today, when I talk about salt, it's going to be about sodium chloride. Um, that is by far what we use the most because it's super cheap. Um, it costs about seventy dollars a ton um, for the city. So you know, usually you buy salt in pounds. Um, the states and cities buy salt in tons, and it's it's pretty inexpensive, all things considered. Um, and as you can see, some of these other um, salts they just become more expensive. Now in Wisconsin. We're pretty lucky, we have a lot of freshwater resources, and there's not really that many natural salt deposits, if any. And so there's some parts of the country where, uh, you know, if you're talking about lakes becoming salty, someone might say, well, there's there, there are salt lakes in the world. And there's definitely salt lakes in the world. Uh, Great Salt Lake in Utah is a great example. Um, they exist across the country. Um, sometimes that's from evaporation, sometimes it's from just natural salt deposits. Wisconsin doesn't have any natural salt deposits, uh, neither does Minnesota. Um, and so almost all of the rivers and lakes in these two states tend to be you know, really fresh water because you just don't have a lot of salts you know, geologically. Um, we actually we mine a lot of our salt from Michigan. They have some nice salt mines under Lake Erie. And naturally, salt concentrations should be pretty low in lakes. This is actually. Uh, a data set from Sweden, and there's two lines drawn on this graph. One is chloride concentrations in the lake, and the other one is precipitation, so rain. And this is shown on an annual basis. So this goes from 1980 to 2015. And what's important to see here is that when the rain goes up, the chloride concentration goes down. So what's happening is that you have a lake, and it has some, some chloride in it naturally, um, and that's mostly from just weathering of rocks. Um, when it rains, you just get this influx of fresh water, and it kind of flushes the lake out. So chloride is what we call a conservative ion. Things aren't really interested in using it. Um, it's, it just stays dissolved in the water. And that's different than other uh, elements, like something like phosphorus, where you put phosphorus in the water, algae are going to use it. Right? They're going to eat it up. Um, and actually, it you know, can stay in the sediment, and just leads to sort of this legacy of phosphorus. Chloride's a little different. It actually just stays dissolved in the water. And so if you stop adding salt, you can flush a lot of that chloride out. And so that's what we're seeing here. When it rains, chloride gets flushed out. When there's a drought period, um, so in the, the 90s, you can see the, the precipitation goes way down, chloride goes up, because you just don't have a lot of fresh water coming in and flushing it out. And so you're probably evaporating. And so there's this natural climate cycle that oscillates in the opposite direction of rain. And that's sort of what naturally happens. 
And all of that chloride that's in these lakes and rivers just gets flushed out into the oceans eventually. And our oceans are salty because over time, they just built up all this salt that's washed off the continents. And the oceans have received, they receive all different types of elements. But they're mostly sodium and chloride because nothing's using the sodium and chloride. So yeah, we flush calcium into the oceans too, but organisms use calcium to build their bodies. Corals use calcium to build coral reefs. Nothing's really interested in using chloride. And so it's a really good tracer of what we're putting down on the landscape and how that's go, you know, being routed through our freshwater landscape. I mentioned that Wisconsin and Minnesota don't have any natural salt deposits, and so the concentrations here are pretty low. Um, humans have, have changed that. We changed a lot of things when it comes to biogeochemistry. Um, and we add salt to the environment in a lot of different ways, and some you may never have heard of or thought too much about. So this is a, a recent uh, chloride budget for the state of Minnesota, and it shows the different areas and how many tons Minnesota uses on an annual basis. So I'm going to just kind of go through these, because it might not be legible in the back. So the, the elephant in the room is root salt. Minnesota here uses about 400,000 tons of road salt a year at a state level. Uh, that's pretty equivalent to what Wisconsin uses. Um, we have about the same number of people, kind of the same number of roads, same number of lakes. We're pretty similar, so when you look at this, you can, you can think about Wisconsin being pretty equivalent. Um, those are just state numbers. So the state of Wisconsin uses about 500,000 tons on average of road salt a year. And that's just what the state's bidding out. Um, on its salt contracts. There's also municipalities buying salts, um, and then there's you know, a whole lot of private applicators buying salts as well. And so estimates are more like a million tons a year at a state level when you think about all of the salt that's actually being put down. So definitely there's other sources of salt, but road salt really is like the main player when it comes to total tonnage a year. Um, the, second, the second bar here is synthetic fertilizer use. Um, and so fertilizers tend to have potassium chloride in them, um, and that's, you know, the more agriculture you have, the more fertilizer you use, and that's going to run off into your waters as well. And I'm sure you've had talks on phosphorus and nitrogen coming from fertilizers, but you also have chloride as well, at, although at a lower scale. Um, the next one is livestock excretion, uh, and that's just because animals are eating salts naturally. You know, we put salts in their diet so they kind of maintain a, the right salt load. That's excreted. The manure is put on fields, and that's sort of washed off into, into water as well. Um, the fourth one is household water softeners. Um, and they say household here, but there's also commercial water softeners, and they operate at a very big scale. And that's something that in, in Madison specifically, um, has a huge impact on the total chloride budget. Almost, I don't know, who here doesn't have a water softener in their house? A couple people. I asked this to a group of college kids last week, and they were like, none of us have water softeners. Um, so, you know, once you start owning houses, you start caring about your appliances, and you have a water softener to, to keep those from scaling up, right? Um, and depending on how old your water softener is, the older it is, the less efficient it's going to be. So if you're dumping bags of salt into it on a regular basis, that salt is ending up in our in our sewage in our sewage district, and the sewage plants can't remove salt. It's just way too expensive, and so that's all just released into the in Madison's case down into the Rock River. So water softeners, especially in big urban areas, have really big impact on the chloride load. Uh, and so this is something that the sewage district here is trying to work on, which is you know reminding people that their appliances. Your water softener is decades old, it's probably time to think about replacing it to something more efficient. Um, and really working with commercial buildings that have, you know, that are treating thousands of gallons of water per day. So Madison doesn't have a lot of industry. Um, Oscar Meyer, when it closed, it was the biggest water user and the biggest chloride input into the sewage district. Uh, and so, you know, not having a lot of industry does help in the chloride budget, but there are other places where industrial sources are. Um, the last ones are all really small. There's a little bit of atmospheric deposition. 
There's a little bit of dust control. Um, so on dirt roads, people put down chloride in the summer to just keep the dust um, from being airborne. Um, and the rest are, are pretty minor. So thinking now about how humans are impacting the chloride load, um, the, the graph on the left is the one you saw, sort of this natural chloride cycle. Um, the graph on the right is the same idea, chlorides in red and precipitations in gray. And what we see, this is a lake from northern Wisconsin, we see that chlorides just sort of increasing through time with a slight deviation in the, the mid to late 2000s. Um, and precipitation is doing what we expect. There's sort of a, a drought rain cycle that goes on over a period of a few decades. And so what we see here, interestingly, is that in this period where we see this decrease in chlorine, we also see a decrease in rain. So this is a pretty significant drought period up in northern Wisconsin. And so during this drought period, the chlorine actually decreased, which is the opposite of what we should see naturally. So what we've managed to do is actually reverse this climate cycle, this climate pattern, where during periods of drought, the chloride concentrations decrease because A, we're probably not applying as much road salt, and there's not as much, um, wa there's not as much rain washing in all the road salt that we do apply. So uh, we've managed to kind of take this climate um, chloride correlation and just completely reverse it because we add so much salt to make it large. Um, and so, you know, once, once it starts raining again, once that drought period is over, the chlorides go right back to where they were on that sort of linear trend. And this is something that we see all over the state um, as sort of this steady, steady rise in chloride. Um, often our, our data sets don't go back all that long, and so it's, we don't really know when it started. Um, luckily, the concentrations are still pretty low most places, um, but they are increasing. The, the question that comes up a lot is, you know, how much salt is bad? That's a question that everyone wants to know, especially regulators. Um, and I would say as a limnologist, there's, there's no threshold of where all of a sudden salt is bad. It's sort of a, you know, the more salt you add, the worse it's going to be. It's sort of my philosophy. It's like any pollutant, right? It's as you increase the amount of it, uh, you're stressing whatever's living in a lake. Or if you're drinking the water, the more salt you add, the progressively more dangerous it's gonna become for you to drink that water. Um, it's not like all of a sudden at a certain concentration, suddenly it has health implications. So that being said, there are thresholds that the EPA, um, the Wisconsin DNR, and other agencies have set for what makes chloride toxic to freshwater environments. And these are their thresholds. Um, the EPA says at 230 milligrams per liter, that's the chronic toxicity for chloride. And so regulators often look at the concentrations of lakes and say, well, if they're below this, that's okay. If they're above this, it's a problem. Which doesn't really make sense ecologically. Um, and, but that's, you know, we do have to often give people a number. So this is what they, these are, with the caveat that obviously three different agencies have, have chosen pretty different concentrations from what they consider to be chronically toxic. Um, and to give you a sense of what that concentration is, usually I have a five gallon bucket with me. Um, that's, my, that's my one prop. It was too hard to bike with a five gallon bucket this morning. But imagine I'm holding a five gallon bucket. And my question to you is, if I want to take this five gallon bucket full of fresh water, so zero milligrams per liter of chloride, and raise it to 230 milligrams per liter, how much salt would I need to put in there? Teaspoon. Yeah, so a lot of people are saying teaspoon. I feel like you guys have read some, uh, some salt literature. So the answer is, <laughs> people have already seeded you with the, the answers. So yeah, the answer is a teaspoon. Um, and so it, you know, to, to pollute a five gallon bucket of water takes one teaspoon of salt, it's not very much. And so especially when you consider how much salt is put down on sidewalks and driveways, I mean, you're not applying that with teaspoons, right? Like you're applying that with giant scoops. You're probably applying that with five gallon buckets, actually. And so it's really easy to pollute our fresh water. And we have a lot of it. So we're not you know, in crisis mode yet, but we've been salting with 
you know, a thousand tons, or sorry, a million tons of salts statewide every year, um, and we're seeing the ramifications now of these chlorine concentrations increasing. So yeah, the answer is one teaspoon of salt pollutes a five gallon bucket of water. Um, to give you context, Lake Mendota, which is a big lake, right, it's one of the biggest lakes in the state, um, it's about 570 million cubic meters of water, which means it would take 128,000 tons of salts to, to raise it to that chronic threshold. And that's just in you know, one, one dump of salt. Um, to give you context, um, Dane County on, a, on an annual basis uses about 30,000 tons of salt. Um, and so the, the capacity to pollute these lakes is real, right? Dane County's putting 30,000 tons of salt down each year. That's going to end up in our water. It's either going to end up in the groundwater or the surface water, and we're seeing both happening. So in Madison, um, that's what we see. This is a, the trend lines for our three uh, biggest lakes in the city. So Mendota's in red, Mendota's in blue, and Wingo's in yellow. And what you see is that in the 40s, pre-salt, the concentrations were about one milligram per liter. Um, and this is really incredible data. There's very few data sets that go back that far in time. Someone in Madison in the 40s uh, was, was really has a forethought in, in measuring the concentrations. And what that shows us is we can actually see what the lakes were like before we started applying water wood salt. Um, and so this is, um, I've, I've come across almost no records that go back this far. And what we see is this, this really the steady increase in salts. Wingress jumps around a lot, it's a really shallow lake. Um, its residence time is really short, it's pretty easy to flush out. Um, and we acknowledge this trend back in the 70s. There was a lot of literature in Madison in the 1970s saying, look, we're, you know, we're making Wingress salty. And so there's been plans in place for decades to reduce that, but the concentrations are still increasing. So we really haven't seen a decrease in salt concentrations in any of the lakes here really at any point in the last 60 years. Um, and part of that is that when you apply salt to the ground, it has the potential to stay there as well for a while before it's flushed into the lakes. And so we call this legacy salt or legacy chloride that even if we stop salting now, you know, we've been piling on millions of tons every year for 60 years. And so likely it's gonna take a long time to flush that out. So the estimates are, on the order of decades. So not forever, in our, in our lifetime. Um, and as we, start, as we start fleshing that out, it's gonna decrease. Um, but we really haven't seen any decrease yet. Um, and the state roads commission, uh, city roads, they're all aware of this problem um, and management practices are changing rapidly. Uh, and it's gonna be interesting to see you know, when, these, when these start to plateau and if we can actually bring um, this is not a Madison problem. This is a snowy region problem. Um, you know, 70% of Americans live in a region that uses road salt. This extends from Minnesota all the way to the East Coast. And the ramifications are that we have really salty rivers and lakes. Um, so this is a, a heat map of chloride concentrations in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And what you see is the the yellow dots, sort of the yellow and orange, are concentrations over like 100 to 1,000 milligrams per liter. So that's above that, you know, getting to and above that EPA threshold. And we're really concentrated in urban areas. So if you know your geography, Milwaukee, Twin Cities, um, Milwaukee has a lot of rivers that have very high chloride concentrations in the spring. Um, the area around Green Bay. Um, and then as you go up north where there's just not that many people, and actually the temperatures get a little bit too cold for road cells to be super effective. You, you don't see this problem as much. Although there are a lot of localized hotspots in northern counties where we do see, especially with shallow groundwater wells near roads, concentrations getting pretty high. So that being said, groundwater is another issue that, especially in Madison, is pretty pertinent. Um, so this is something you've probably seen in the paper um, if you live in Shorewood Hills, you definitely know, or definitely have heard of this. Um, and that's that some of our wells are getting kind of salty. 
And Madison's interesting. We have a, a series of distributed wells across the city. And so depending on where you live, you're getting a different source of your drinking water. And you can look that up. You can type in your address online and see what wells you're on. Sometimes they change in the winter and the summer. Um, sometimes they mix well water together, um, especially if one's getting super salty and they might want to mix it with one that's not as salty to try and balance that out. Um, the one that's in the news in the papers here is, is Well 14. It's just off University in Sherwood Hills. And the concentrations of chloride have been pretty steadily increasing. So in 2000, they were 58 milligrams per liter. 2016, it was 135. And then this past summer, um, about 150. And so there's been a lot of concern as to, you know, where is this chloride coming from? In you know another ten years, this is going to start hitting a concentration where you're going to start tasting it, um, which is not pleasant. Like no one wants their water to taste like salt water, um, and you know it's going to cost Madison millions of dollars to drill a new well if they have to, right? So there's huge economic incentive to decrease salt use and figure out what's going on. Um, so this is a a groundwater map of. Madison um, and did sort of a Dane County cross section. So, don't want to complicate this too much, but there's, it's interesting if you want to know where your drinking water comes from. There's a big aquifer in this, this is gray color, and that's where most of the, the city wells tap into. So, they're trying to stay drinking water from this deep aquifer um, that's, you know, <coughs> has relatively clean drinking water, uh, sort of avoiding those upper layers that interact with more of the surface processes. So our wells are drilled down into that, that aquifer. Um, however, they also can sometimes capture water from some of those upper aquifers. So what seems to be happening with well 14, to my best understanding, is that instead of taking water from that deep aquifer, it's actually taking water from that kind of light yellow band. Um, I feel like someone gave me a laser pointer. This band here. And that that, off, that upper aquifer is actually just a lot more likely to have surface infiltration because it's closer to the surface. And so instead of, instead of drawing less salty water down here, that well is actually hitting this other layer. Um, and this is a cool warble video um, that probably won't work because I probably don't have internet on the computer, right? Then think about that. You can actually see the, some of the fractures in the bedrock. And so when you have fractures in bedrock, surface water can just more quickly infiltrate. And so what's happening is we're putting down a lot of road salt in this area around Shorewood Hills, and it's ending up in our groundwater relatively quickly. Um, and so there's been a lot, there's a lot of work going on currently to try and figure out how much chlorine we're putting on the surface and trying to stem this increase, you know, before it hits concentrations where you can't drink that water anymore. Okay, what's next? Um, we've, you know, I've tried to talk about the fact that we're seeing chloride increases in all of our lakes, you know, all the ones that are in environments that might be impacted by road salt. So basically any river or lake near a road um, in the entire state. So that's thousands of rivers and lakes and then lots of groundwater as well. Um, but Honestly, I think this is a problem that we can solve. You know, first of all, we need to start thinking about chloride as an environmental pollutant. It's, it is a safe compound, so you buy a bag of salt and it's like eco-friendly. And it is, I mean, we eat salt on a regular basis. We need it for our diets. Um, but as humans, we know that we can't have too much salt, right? You can't drink ocean water. You will become dehydrated. Your body just can't handle that amount of, those amount of ions. Um, and it's the same thing with rivers and lakes. Organisms are evolved to live in freshwater environments. A lot of them don't have the capacity to deal with a huge ion load in the water. And so as we add more salt to the environment, we're just stressing out all these organisms that have like, never had to deal with this. Um, so it really you know, likely will start causing shifts in food web um, and different species communities as we increase these salinity concentrations. However, we can reverse this trend. Chloride is soluble and inert. Um, it's not being taken up by anything, and we have the potential to flush it out. And all that takes is to decrease salt use, honestly. 
We use a million tons as a state per year, and we can bring that number way down without sacrificing public safety, right? I'm not saying we should, we should have a sub ban, because there's there's no good alternatives to really ICAs. Um, you know, there's there's circumstances where salt use is appropriate, um, especially on you know high speed roads, Beltline Interstate, and things like that. But you know, we really, really need to think about whether or not we need to sell parking lots, for instance. You know, can we can we plow parking lots and put down something for traction, maybe rear winter boots with, with good traction and, and just not salt some of these spots. Um, so we need to really optimize our salt use is what it comes down to. Um, and there's a few ways to do that. One is just using less. So either as a as a resident, just not using any if you don't need to. Um, as a if you're a commercial business, scaling back um, and talking to people about liability. Um, and then the city and the state are doing a lot in terms of switching to more brining practices, and that's something we can get into as well. But that, by using a, a liquid salt mixture, they're actually able to decrease their salt use by 30 to 50 percent. So, if you're the state who's buying 500,000 tons of salt a year, and you can reduce that by 50 percent, that's going to go a huge distance to decreasing that salt load. Um, there's no great alternatives to salt. It's really effective. It's really effective in melting ice. Um, people talk about beet juice or other organic alternatives, and those alternatives are not really to melt ice. They're more to help salt or sand adhere to ice. They're kind of sticky, but they can actually lead to their own biological problems because they're all organic compounds, and so you're, you're basically just putting food down into the environment that microbes can eat and as they, as they consume that organic material, they actually use up oxygen, and so you can have oxygen problems in, in freshwater environments. And so as a limnologist, I would say the organic alternatives are not the best solution. Um, green infrastructure is kind of cool. Um, so one of, um, one of the solutions might be permeable pavement. Um, and what that is is it allows water to uh, percolate through it. Um, and so I'm not a roads and asphalt engineer by any means, but what that would allow is that instead of water pooling on the surface and then at night freezing into ice, it actually could uh, percolate through the pavement um, and then you just wouldn't have as much ice forming in general. Um, so that's one solution that um, people are looking into. That's It's good for a lot of reasons. It's also, at the moment, expensive and a lot harder than asphalt to put down. It has other implications for things like plowing, um, but that's that's something that might be talked about more in the future. And there's also a few policy options. Um, one is just getting information out there. Uh, we all have grown up with road salt just being used at you know freely everywhere, um, and so the more we talk about the implications of that, the more people might. Just think about whether or not their the strategies they have been using are the best strategies. Um, you know, it's it's easy to dump down thousands of, of tons if you don't think it's having any impact. Um, but as we as we talk to people about the environmental impact of salt, and that, that's like that's not even the only impact. I mean, there's huge corrosion problems with infrastructure that have big economic um, implications. So, getting information out there is is the way to start this conversation. Um, you know, if you go to your local business and don't like the piles of salt you see on the parking lot, you can talk to them and say, hey, you know, you guys can use less, and, and that has direct influence on, you know, all of our drinking water. Um, so starting the conversation is the first part. Um, there's something called incentivized self-governance, which is trying to convince people that using less salt is in their best interest. So the most obvious one is the less salt you use, the less salt you have to buy, right? So you're just going to save money. Um, and yeah, salt is cheap, but it still saves you money if you don't have to buy as much. Um, and when we talk to private applicators, usually the conversation goes something like this. You're like, well, if you guys use less salt, you can save money. They're like, well, if we use less salt, someone might sue us, and then we have to spend a whole lot more money. Um, and the solution to that so far has been trying to protect applicators 
um, with well, basically liability waivers, um, and that goes that comes from um, usually programs are at the state level. So New Hampshire has one where applicators can take a training session and say, you know, we were trained, we passed an exam, we're a you know a gold or a green star certified salt applicator, and with that comes a liability waiver from the state saying unless you're grossly negligent, like you have you you know you can't be sued uh, for slip and falls. So if we can help protect people who have perceived liability, then they're all, by all means, happy to use less salts. Um, so that's one, one way. Um, the other one's regulation. That's not something, I mean, like most people don't like regulation. Um, but you could easily have regulations that say, you can't use salts on parking lots. Or there's countries where, um, in Europe, there's, you know how we have um, like winter, how would they call it? Winter emergency days in Madison, where the, the you alternate park, you know, you the street parking changes basically, and people get a text message saying like, "Hey, it's a winter emergency day." There's countries where they have that system with salt, which is like, you can't use salt unless it's one of these days, and we say, "Okay, today, you know, you can use it." And that that <coughs> infrastructure is already set up, right? We already get texts telling us when we can't park on the road. Um, you could also easily get texts that say, okay, today, you know, you can salt. Um, or regulations that say, you know, yeah, no salting in parking lots, no salting on your lakefront property, um, things like that. Um, and the last one that's never gonna happen is economic measures. So you just make salt more expensive. People buy less of it. Um, but that's pr pretty unrealistic. Um, but the reason we use so much is because it's so cheap. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there, and there's usually people have questions about lots of different things, so I'm happy to take questions for a while. Um, I will say, as just a plug from the Center for Limnology, um, we are doing a Dan the Badger donation match on April 9th, so if you're interested in supporting local limnology, which is usually students, uh, feel free to um, check us out. And thanks to all the other awesome professors. Okay, we're gonna um, raise your hand if you have questions. They're gonna walk around with the microphone, um, and I see my hand up first, so I'm gonna ask the first one. If you mind. Um, uh, Hillary, I'm, I'm curious what the toxicity impacts are of salt, uh, specifically with with the lakes. Yeah, so it's um, it's completely dependent on species. Um, some are really adaptable to higher chlorine concentrations. So think of something like salmon who live half their life in the ocean and half their life in the rivers, you know, they have the internal capacity to, to regulate their ion balance because they have those two habitats they live in. Um, other species don't, and so as you increase the ion load, they're spending so much energy trying to like pump those ions out of their bodies that when you spend that much energy just trying to maintain your internal ion balance, you're not gonna be able to reproduce well, um, you might die, um, and it's amazing the, the variability in success in saline environments, just even within like the same family of zooplankton, for instance. Some are better at surviving than others. Um, and also, as you get to smaller life forms that have faster life cycles, and so like a, when you talk about you know, microbes or even plankton where you have many life cycles per year, they actually can evolve to like over time as well. And so there's some indication that maybe in really salty lakes that have been steadily increasing, you're actually selecting organisms that also can survive in saline conditions. So evolution is an interesting part of that as well. Um, but what I tell people a lot is that, you know, if, if anything, we're just helping invasive species because they tend to be these generalists who can survive in any condition. And so zebra mussels, you know, if you're in Lake Minota, they came from the Black Sea and, and brackish conditions, and they don't care about the chlorine that we're pumping into the lake. The native mussels probably care a whole lot, um, and so if anything, we're just helping um, non-native species by, they, by basically stressing the native species. I'm still processing that. I can't remember my own question. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm interested in brining because it seems as though if you can make 
uh, brine that's a certain uh, good concentration, um, you want to make it available for home or commercial use, wouldn't that be easier uh, for those of us who don't really understand how many little pieces of you know, rock salt mm -hmm. per square foot is a uh, acceptable, you know, yeah. salt-wise thing. If it were quick and easy and convenient, um, would, would that be a, um, one solution for non- Yeah. Yeah, so brining, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is um, basically just taking rock salt and adding it to water, so you have a saline water mixture. Um, and it's effective because with rock salt, often when you're tossing it on the ground, it like clumps up. And a clump of rock salt's not going to do you any good. It's going to melt just as effectively as a little piece of rock salt in that area. Um, and it's not really until that pile of salt melts and actually just becomes brine, naturally, um, that you then can kind of spread its effectiveness around. Um, so when you're at home tossing rock salt, it's clumping. When trucks are dumping it on highways, it's, am I getting that sound? It's bouncing off the road and into the ditch, and so it's not going to do anything, it's just going right into the environment. So with brine, you're able to spray it more evenly, so it's more effective, and it also sticks better to the ground. And so you could just use way less salt per lane mile. Um, and what's, in the past, why we haven't done this is because no one thought rock salt was that big of a deal. So it's only now that we're, having, we're seeing the environmental and health implications of that, that People are realizing that this is actually one of the easy solution. Um, and right now we're still building up that infrastructure capacity. So for um, like county, so the in Wisconsin, all the counties are in charge of their county roads. The state DOT oversees that. Um, the state DOT has invested money in certain counties, um, basically pilot programming grind, but it takes a lot of capital investment to change all your trucks from dump trucks to tanker trucks, right? You need to have different infrastructure to be able to spray brine. Um, and so right now, you know, they piloted this in a few counties. Jefferson County was the first one to really get, like, really change all their infrastructure over to brining. And they've seen, from what I can tell, like incredible improvements on their, their total salt budget and also just their, their roads. Um, I guess anyone who, I've, I don't drive that much, but and barely anyone who drives from Waukesha to Madison, like Jefferson County roads are incredible. Like they're, they have these giant tanker trucks that spray the spray I-94. Um, and they're using less salt doing it. So um, now there's, I think, 15 or 17 counties that have had investment from the state to build brine infrastructure. The city of Madison makes its own brine. Um, and commercial applicators in Madison can go to the city roads um, building, which is on Park Street. And, purchase brine from them. Um, and the, the only limitation to using it, like using that system at your, your own house is just, it's one more step, right? Like you just, instead of buying the salt and putting it down, you have to buy salt and mix it and then spray it. So really it, it's still a little bit of investment on anyone's part to just get different equipment. Um, but yeah, all it takes is the like two pounds of salt per five gallon, sorry, Two pounds of salt per yeah five gallon bucket to make a salt mixture, um, and so you can yeah you can easily do it yourself. It's just it's just one additional step. And well, until the brining takes off for the area, yeah. I was walking here downtown and watching an applicator with a bucket throwing salt out, and I went okay, I'm not going to say anything because yeah. at this point it's not going to help. I need to become a card carrying member, which has little cards with the salt wives, got yeah, the salt wives, got the back documents, back. and just say, hey, take this and use this, and on the back there's a dollar off coupon for, mm. you know, coffee or yeah. something, because I'm trying to get the brain to re educate that we don't have to have all that salt. And I know the applicators are being trained. Yeah, I mean, most people are. It's What's hard is that it really is the people with boots on the ground who are making the decisions. So, you know, thinking about, you know, university campus is a great place to. There's people who take care of the roads, but then there's also facilities managers who take care of each individual building, and sometimes they have multiple people, and you know, who's the person actually applying the salt? Well, there's hundreds of people actually applying the salt. And you know, it's you get in the morning, maybe there's a billion other things going on, and you also have to go sell the parking lot, it's easier to just go up there and 
just like chuck a bunch of salt down because it's that's really fast, right? And some of it will melt. Um, and so the more <coughs> education we can really um, give to people about the implications of that, I think, you know, hopefully people will start to be more cognizant of, of what they're doing. But yeah, it's frustrating. You also don't want to interrupt someone like whose job it is to sell. You also don't want to be guilty, I think, at least I do, trying to go up to someone and say, like, hey, by the way, you don't need this much. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, just, but trying to talk to buildings facility managers is a good place to start. Um, you know, they're dealing with both roads usually and water softeners, and so you can get a two for one on that. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, you mentioned chloride consistently. What about the counter ion sodium? So, yeah, so I, yeah, that's a great question. I talk about chloride the more so because it's it's the one that's more conservative, so it's really not being used by anything, and so it's easier. It's an easier tr tracking ion, I guess, if you will. So we often use chloride to to track water flow paths in general. Um, sodium is j more utilized by organisms. And so the sodium concentrations are going up as well. Um, they're just usually they don't go up quite as quickly as chloride just because organisms take up take in sodium. Um, in soils, often what will happen is as you increase sodium, um, the instead of the sodium going through the soil into the groundwater, it, it reaches calcium and magnesium instead, and there's sort of this ion switch with these positive ions. So I don't talk about sodium that much because it just has other um, sort of, there's, it's biogeochemical cycling is a little bit, just a little bit more complicated, but sodium is also increasing. It actually has bigger human health implications when it comes to drinking water. Um, sodium's, um, if anyone who has hypertension or is on low sodium diets, um, sodium's the problem, not chloride. They just usually go hand in hand, um, which is why we talk about chloride more often. They're equally difficult to measure. It's not like one's easier to, to actually measure. Oh, thank you very much. Um, a couple things. Uh, yes, we do have we do have training uh, right here in the Madison area for salt applicators, and I and I wondered if uh, maybe Phil Gabler is here, or someone who knows. Do we also have the liability uh, reduction of those people first? Second, um, what? What relative portion of the chloride problem is water softeners? And I know, you know, of course, everything goes through MMSD and then out into Badfish Creek and down into the river, so it's not ubiquitous uh, in our groundwater and our, in our lakes. But what portion of that would you say is the problem? And third, what about what about places? Are there places in cities and towns that have said, you know what, we don't need salt? Because I thought I've heard about this. Do you know about know anything experience you have of, of places that don't use salt at all, or almost at all, except maybe on their very main roads? Because uh, uh, a lot of places I thought I've heard can say you just plow well, yeah. and you know, people go slower, and you don't really need that much salt. So, thank you. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions there. So the first one was about liability waivers. I think New Hampshire is the only state to have done that so far. Um, Minnesota is trying to get something through the legislation. Ontario and Canada has a similar salt training program with no liability waiver, and that's been, um, I think, a problem, because that liability waiver is one of the reasons New Hampshire's program is so successful. Um, in talking to a lawyer in Canada at one point, what was interesting was there was no evidence of liability. There's been virtually no cases that have really gone to trial of slip and falls against salt applicators, usually they're just settled by the court. And so there's no, like, yeah, there's no one really knows entirely what the liability is, but most of it's actually perceived, like people think they're gonna get sued, and really people might threaten to sue them, and they settle, or they get, or it just gets dropped. So there really isn't maybe as much liability as we think there is, is one interesting part of that. But, um, <coughs> Phil is here. I don't think Madison or Wisconsin has any kind of liability program. We don't. Yeah. Um, so the second. You part, said we don't. We do not. We do not. Okay. We worked a little bit on that, but it's a uh, it's a long uh, legal process to get that. Okay. Minnesota, I think, has been working on these for five or six years, taking it to the assembly. Like they have a vote, and it's still not passing. Right now, the main opposition. Lawyers, talk 
personal injury lawyer. This is why we didn't give Phil the microphone. <laughs> the water stop near balance. Um, I don't know if anyone's done the budget here in Madison, but the Twin Cities is about half. So like, we're probably pretty similar to that. Um, it's, you know, honestly, the sewage district is dealing with this. They, like, for them, I mean, the, for them, the biggest input is water softeners. Um, but they don't even know where all the big water softeners are. You know, they spent years now trying to track down those big commercial applicators because a lot of them, if they improve their efficiency, you would see big increases. So Madison sewage district is basically trying to stay under this chloride concentration. And so they're doing everything they can to try and find the big inputs. Um, and so most of, you know, most of their water's from Madison, um, and that's water softeners. Some of it's from just direct input from runoff, so they actually do have to deal with their own salt issues. Um, they, so you say water softeners. Um, I lost my train of thought on that. But yeah, so they're, they're trying to find and uh, improve the efficiency of water softeners throughout the city is sort of one of their big pushes to basically keep their chloride concentrations below EPA, Clean Water Act guidelines. Um, so, yeah, they're, but it's probably, my guess is around now, in terms of city. They're going different spots, right? Road salt's going to the lakes, sewage, rivers. Yeah. Yeah. Cities with no salt. yeah, so um, every time I give one of these talks, there's someone in the audience who's lived in Scandinavia and comes up to me and they're like, well, in Sweden or well, in Finland, they really don't use salt. Um, they just have a very different attitude towards dealing with winter weather, which is it's winter and it's going to snow, um, and we're going to have infrastructure to deal with that. And so there's a few um, a few ways. Like one, there's lots of parts of this world where everyone has snow tires and has vehicles that are you know, much better at being safe in winter conditions, and that's something that you don't really use a whole lot of here. Uh, we kind of expect our roads to be clear and us, and us to be able to drive, you know, our all season tires all season. Um, the other one is um, they, they put out a lot more like traction devices. So someone just recently told me she lived in Finland for two years and they just used these sharp rock, like sharp little rocks everywhere, and they would just spread them on all the sidewalks. When it snowed, they would just spread them everywhere. Um, and then when it in the spring when it melted. You know, then the rocks start piling up, and they basically have street sweepers that came along and collected them, and I think they reused them. Uh, they sounded very quaint. It's like, at what scale do they? Um, but they use it on the sidewalks and the roads just for traction. And they, they, they might use some salt in intersections on hills. You know, that was the extent of their use. Um, but you know, as you, move, as you get into colder environments, salt becomes less effective. So you don't have to go too far north to not to be, go to areas where there's, there's absolutely no one salt doesn't do anything. And so there are people, yeah, they plow, they have snow tires, so they have seven tires or something even more effective. Um, the problem here is that we're in this like slush belt that keeps freezing and thawing and just icing everywhere, right? And so we're in these really unique conditions where you get a lot of ice and salt is really effective at doing what it does. And so um, you know, there's, there's probably Madison, I mean, the streets, in, the, the streets Commission in Madison is really thinking a lot about this, which is, when do we actually need to use salt? And so there, I don't know if you remember, like, in April in 2018, it snowed a bunch, and they didn't salt at all. They, you know, like, it's April, the sun's actually pretty strong in April, it's all going to melt by this evening. And it did, and so they just said, you know, we're not going to salt anything, the morning commute's going to suck because it just snowed, but that snow's going to disappear. Conversely, three days ago, everything was covered in ice, and then well, yesterday we got eight inches of snow, or you know, some, I don't know, was eight, but we got a lot of snow yesterday. Um, and so they made the decision that we need to get rid of some of this ice before it snows, or else things are gonna just tear up out there. And so on uh, Monday, they salted every street in Madison, which is unprecedented. They don't usually salt anything but major roads and bus routes. Um, so, you know, you, Sometimes Mother Nature just gives you terrible conditions, um, and you know there's, you know, trying to optimize that salt use is really, I think, a more realistic than stopping salting. I guess I don't know. 
have time for one or two more questions. Can you make any comment about alternatives, ice melting alternatives you can buy in a hardware store, what their environmental impact is or what's in it? Yeah, so there's often, if you go into you know, Home Depot or something, there's, there's different bags of melters, and often they'll just do something like Eco Melter. And um, there's, you, I mean, I think they usually have the ingredients on the bag somewhere, but often they're still a salt mixture. And they can say they're eco-friendly because salt's not a toxic compound, right? Um, so you can you can say all of these salts are eco-friendly. Um, so they're not really lying on the bag. It's just we know that you know there's environmental consequences. Often they will just be a mixture of um, salts uh, and some of the other salts that melt at lower temperatures, so something like magnesium or calcium, um, and that's usually what they are, is just different, different salt mixtures. Sometimes there's organic compounds in there um, to make it adhere better. Usually there's an anti-caking agent, so it doesn't stick together. Um, there's, if you see salt that's colored, the blue salt or purple salt, that's all just the anti-caking agent um, to try and not have it clump together, especially when it starts absorbing humidity and salt tends to clump. Like, we all have salt savers, you know? You've all seen that happen uh, in your house, probably. Um, and you know, there's those anti-caking agents can be a whole different bunch of different chemicals. So sometimes they actually are toxic. Not so you can get like cyanide compounds as an anti-caking agent. Um, so the ones that are eco-friendly, they're usually are like not as hazardous. But um, so there are you know you can if you get deep into the road salt literature, you'll you'll start seeing some of these other compounds. But the other thing to realize too is that salt is actually really effective at leaching heavy metals and things like that from the environment. So there's a whole other environmental consequence of wood salt, which is that chlorides are, are pretty great at liberating metals. So things like lead or mercury that are that are stored in the environment into fresh water. So that was the Flint water crisis was um, you know part of that was they switched from a freshwater source, which was Lake Erie, to the river, which had way higher chloride concentrations. And that chloride was really effective in stripping lead from pipes. And so other heavy metal implications for chloride as well. So I think we're out of time for questions. I want to thank Dr. Dugan one more time for a fascinating talk. Uh, a couple of things before you go. Can you stick around for just a few minutes? Yeah, yeah. OK, so I think uh, Hillary will be up here if you guys have some questions to get to. Um, our friends at SaltWise have these sitting out on the table when you leave if you want. This is a cup. Tells you how much salt you should use for a 20 foot driveway or a or 10 sidewalk squares, and then it even shows you how you should. So you can grab one of these if you want. And then there's some great information from SaltWise out there. Thank you, Phil, for bringing this stuff. Um, so I grab that. It's on the table on your way out. Next month, I believe we have a, uh, a speaker from Ho Chunk who will be coming in, uh, giving us some history about the area. So that should be pretty exciting. Uh, that's it. Drive safe out there, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Try to get home. I'm gonna to try to get headed towards close like at 12 before 12, and I'll call you. I'll call you as I'm going down the alley.